I'm Angino. Welcome to the Mangino Talks podcast. We talk about everything that matters to Pittsburgh, from current events to Pittsburgh history, social issues to sports, politics to practical day-to-day life. And today on this Memorial Day 2023, I was made aware for the first time, and I am ashamed to say this, but it is for the first time, the McKeesport 23. Uh, 23 young men all living inside of McKeesport, all with that is their home address, 23 men that died in Vietnam. And to help us learn more about these 23 men is Donald Nemchik. Uh, Donald is a graduate of McKeesport High School, class of 1968, enlisted in the U.S. Navy back in 1970, served as a petty officer at various communication stations in Southeast Asia, and finally, on board the USS Constellation, an attack aircraft carrier, was involved in the last combat air operations of the Vietnam War in 1973. Upon returning home from the Navy in 1974, Don was employed by various commercial banks and then finally at the U.S. Small Business Administration in Pittsburgh at the district office there as a Veterans Business Development Officer. Upon retirement, Don remains actively involved in veterans advocacy with the Veterans Breakfast Club, and we will speak more about that coming up in just a little bit. First, though, welcome Donald Nemchek to Mangino Talks. Donald, welcome. Good to have you. Well, thank you, Robert. It's a pleasure being here today. Thank you very much for making time for this uh, very special uh, show of Mangino Talks regarding the McKeesport 23. I am so happy that you reached out to me on Facebook to let me know about the Memorial Day activities that are taking place and how this is a continuation of what's been going on for uh, well north of 50 years. Tell us about the McKeesport 23 and the, the events of Memorial Day. I'll be happy to, Robert. The McKeesport 23 is a a uh, brand that we McKeesport veterans determined would honor the 23 men killed in Vietnam. Starting in 1965, we lost our first soldier, Norman Johnson, and it went forward all the way through till 1970. It was very important to us veterans who had served in Vietnam to honor our classmates, friends, and relatives. We knew almost every one of these 23 men. We would gather monthly at lunchtime, talk about old times, have some fun, tell some stories as guys do. And we started to determine what are we going to do to honor these men? It all began very uh, quickly in the class of 1965 had their 50th class reunion. Mm -hmm. One of the fellows uh, at the reunion uh, made a poster of the three graduates from that class uh, who were killed in Vietnam. All of a sudden, The talk began. Well, how many more guys were killed? Don't we know anybody else? So we began our uh, process of searching Department of Defense and State of Pennsylvania records and determined the uh, home address of those 23 men as McKeesport, Pennsylvania. Clearly, other localities around McKeesport had men who had fallen, but we limited uh, our program to the McKeesport 23. We began at the Boys Club where many of us back in the day learned to box, played ball. It was where we hung out. And uh, when the first young man was killed from McKee's Sport, his name was Norman Johnson. He was a medic, and uh, he was from the boys' club. So we started to say, hey, we know these guys from the boys' club. Let's do something for them. Well, mm-hmm. my cousin, PFC Michael Nemchik, was killed February 1966. At that time, the director of the Boys Club, Sam La Rosa, determined that he's going to erect a memorial to those two fellows who were Boys Club members, knowing that this war was going to escalate in 66, and there's more than likely going to be more casualties coming from that war uh, who were Boys Club members. So in November of 66, they dedicated a flagpole and a brass uh, plaque that we feel that is one of the first official Vietnam memorials in the country. We're working to get some legislation passed to where that's formally recognized, but that's an ongoing process. So as time progressed, clearly other boys were killed. They were put on the plaque. So every Memorial Day and Veterans Day, we veterans and family and friends gather at that location to honor those boys who were killed in Vietnam. 
interestingly, Robert, we use the same wreath that was uh, constructed in 1966. Hmm. Clearly, it's been cleaned up a little bit. But we pass that down amongst the families. Uh, our fa- the families stand in line in the order in which these men fell. And we pass that wreath down. We play taps. We have the rifle salute. There's mm-hmm. comments by officials. And what's very interesting is a lot of the uh, officials, be it the mayor, state senator, state legislators, they often say they go to other locations where they have similar ceremonies. Mm-hmm. And with time progressing, many of those ceremonies are not as well attended as the McKee sports ceremony that seems to grow every year. The names are typical of Western Pennsylvania. We had African American uh, young men, we had Jewish young men, we had Christian young men, we had people of some prominence, their children went, and we had the blue collar steel mill worker. Mm -hmm. It was just the jot and beer guy whose son got drafted but never came home. Let's begin with reading those names, and I can read them and give the date of their uh, death in Vietnam. Please. Then we can expand a little bit on the uh, stories of some of these young men. Please do that. Let's begin. Let's begin. The first casualty of the Vietnam War from McKeesport was Army PFC Norman Boots Johnson. He was killed December 5th, 1965. Army PFC Michael Nem Chick killed February 22nd, 1966. Army PFC Michael Pliska died February 28th, 1966. Army PFC James Francis Brooks Jr. killed May 21st, 1966. Army Staff Sergeant Thomas John Winklevoss killed May 26th, 1966. Army PFC Tyrone Burse killed August 5th, 1966. Marine PFC James Edward West killed September 10th, 1966. Marine Staff Sergeant David Lloyd Moser killed October 6, 1966. Marine Lance Corporal Gregory Popowitz, killed January 4, 1968. Army Specialist 4th Class Curtis Taylor Gay, killed January 30, 1968. Marine Lance Corporal Thomas James Sweeney, killed February 26, 1968. Marine Private 1st Class Lewis Huff, killed March 12, 1968. Air Force Major Jack Plum killed September 21st, 1968. Army Specialist Fourth Class John Germack killed September 13th, 1968. Army Specialist James Robert Long, March 27, 1969. Army PFC Tibor Sotak killed April 20th, 1969. Navy Petty Officer Patrick McNellis killed May 16, 1969. Marine Gunnery Sergeant Ray Gibble, killed July 27, 1969. Army First Lieutenant Richard Arnovitz, killed August 30, 1969. Army PFC Kenneth Klein, killed November 17, 1969. Army First Class Sergeant Donald Robert Donaldson, killed March 10th, 1970. Army Captain Terry Martell killed July 3rd, 1971. Army Specialist Vincent Galka, December 26th, 1971. It's very interesting, Robert, that the McKeesport 23 included 15 that served in the Army, six in the Marine Corps, one in the Navy, one in the Air Force. They died in Vietnam. They would not come home, but they were now over 50 years later Together, together is one, the McKee Sport 23. There are some very moving stories. All of them ultimately are, but there are a couple that really stand out. That's correct, Robert. And that is the first person that was killed. That's Norman Boots Johnson. Boots was his nickname. Uh, Norman Johnson was a a spirited African-American young man in McKee Sport. He was the manager of the high school football team. When he graduated high school, they thought so much of him, they asked him to stay on board and be a paid staff member. Well, he did that. He was a a man of great spirit, et cetera. And, of course, those days he got drafted. Well, Booth wasn't a combatant. He turned out to be a medic. And six months into his tour of duty in country, he was killed in action. His daughter, Kelly, 
was six months old when Boots was killed. She comes to every Memorial Day and Veterans Day program, wow. never forgets her father, had never seen him. Her dream, Robert, was to have dinner with her father someday. And she comes uh, together with us uh, in to honor not only her father, but the other men who were killed in action. And we've become such good friends. We stand shoulder to shoulder where we pass the wreath. And the Memorial Days are very special to us because we recognize the sacrifice, not only by these soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines, mm -hmm. but we recognize the sacrifice of the family members, the Gold Star families who never forget their family member and recognize on this solemn day, Memorial Day, it means a lot more than just a kickoff to the summer season. One of the names that you mentioned was your own cousins. Yes, my cousin Michael. My cousin Michael was 18 years old when he was killed in Vietnam. Michael was a uh, uh, physical fitness uh, enthusiast. When he was at the boys' club, he was always lifting weights, teaching the other boys how to box, running, etc. He enlisted, uh, graduating June of 1965. He, he enlisted. He was in country November. 1965. He was killed February 1966. He was one week shy of his 19th birthday. Michael volunteered for what he called in his last letter to his mother, a suicide mission that he had to, he felt compelled to go on. If he didn't go, who would? He wanted to stop the flow of communism. He was very, very motivated in helping people, mm -hmm. helping the uh, people of uh, Vietnam have a normal life without communism. We were told that early on from uh, politicians, etc., that the domino theory was so important to cease. Uh, he volunteered for a mission to uh, stop the flow of North Vietnamese soldiers coming down from the north. And uh, sadly, uh, he was a point person, and he was killed uh, by sniper fire. He was shot in the abdomen. He uh, didn't die where he fell. He bled out on a helicopter. Mm. When he was returned to Matisport, uh, that city was almost silent during his funeral. You have to remember, that was a robust city of 50,000 people. The steel mills were booming. And everyone felt that, that pain of, of losing a, a, another young man uh, to a war. And it was very, very interesting that even today, my last name, of course, is the same. People can come up to me when I'm in town and say, Don, uh, boy, I remember Mike. He was a good guy. He was up at the boys' club. He always taught us how to be fair and, and have a, a, a good, you know, a sportsmanlike attitude. And, you know, that even transcended when he was in the service because mm. he would assist the chaplains during the uh, masses they had in the field. Uh, they oftentimes uh, had a Christian service. And they all called him, his nickname was Preacher. He always <laughs> wanted to carry the flag during the uh, parades in McKeesport. He was a very patriotic young man, and he'll never be forgotten. Why do you think that the McKeesport 23 are being remembered in a way and have consistently been remembered this way for all of these years? W what is it about McKeesport? I think that's easy to answer. We That, that was a strong... A hard-working blue-collar town, the steel mills ruled there. Uh, the men who worked in those steel mills, many of them were first-generation immigrants, or they came up from the South to find employment. And there was a spirit of patriotism, because for everyone, McKeesport was almost the promised land. There was jobs, there was opportunity, uh, money was uh, coming through, through good paydays. And I think that there was just the fact that uh, many of our fathers, uncles, and, and relatives fought in World War II in Korea. So it was our turn. I have a picture of my family. My father's, uh, five, him and his five brothers were home on leave from World War II in 1943 altogether. That's six men from mm -hmm. the same family, all overseas during the war. Fortunately, they all came back. But that was not uncommon because families were big back then. But everyone had served either in World War II, Korea, and Vietnam early on. So it was not uncommon to have uh, uh, servicemen come home and all of a sudden you were celebrated. It wasn't the counterculture that was in San Francisco and Seattle and Boston and other areas of the country where they scorned the Vietnam veteran returning home. In the case where if you had your uniform on, you probably didn't pay for a beer for the whole week that you were home. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was something that bonded together. And you have to remember, we were all classmates, teammates. The boys' club was a united uh, 
a front of boys and uh, they played ball together and just hung out together. So we all knew each other. We still connect with each other on a monthly basis. And we still tell the same stories and they've stretched out, of course. And <laughs> there's always a, a bonding with us that we always remember somebody. Say, hey, man, do you remember when Mike did this? Or do you remember when Tommy Sweeney was singing, I got the whole world in my hands when he was standing on the corner under the street light? And there's always memories to be had. And that's why I think that the McKee sport area with his patriotism, with the fact that it's so diverse that uh, we all came together in under one umbrella. In this case, it was the McKee sport 23. You know, it wasn't just the, the, the uh, poor kid that didn't go to college or his dad was a mill worker, blue collar. We had a young man, Captain Arnovitz. His father was a prominent doctor in McKee sport. Well, Captain Arnovitz was a young man. He always wanted to play with soldiers and had toy soldiers lined up for battle groups and things like that. We always wanted to play at his house because he had this elaborate setup and he was a pretty good guy. Well, he was the first Jewish graduate of the Pennsylvania Military Academy. And then he got commissioned as a first lieutenant in the Army and got deployed over to Vietnam. What happened with him, his unit was in a firefight. Well, his unit got uh, hit pretty badly. They were calling helicopters in to medevac uh, the wounded, and he was guiding the helicopters in almost at nighttime with a flashlight. Mm -hmm. Well, Vietnam Vietnamese sniper killed him knowing that this uh, brave man was leading the helicopters, and that's just the way it was. So here you had a, a young man from a prominent family. You had individuals like my cousin. His dad was a steel worker, blue collar, basic middle America type guy, an African-American young man whose um, family came here to work in the steel mills, et cetera. And they, they were just hardworking people. So we have that common bond, regardless of economic or religious or um, creed that uh, we thought of. We had a bond together where we had to serve our country, whether we wanted, wanted to or not, whether you were drafted or enlisted. The bottom line was you were serving your country. You raised your right hand and the Army, Navy, Marines, or Air Force. They sent you where they needed you. Not only is the story of the McKeesport 23 uh, one that is being remembered each and every year on Memorial Day, and as you just described with uh, the group with the Veterans Breakfast Club, uh, my understanding is that there was a book that was written. Do you know that boy, One Town's Remembrance of the Vietnam War, Tell us about that book. I sure will. It's very interesting. It was around the Memorial Day holiday, uh, probably about 2014, 2015. I was listening to a radio station, and an oldies disc jockey was talking about their plans for Memorial Day. So I called in, and I says, you know, we're having a ceremony to dedicate a memorial to the McKee Sport 23 at the McKee Sport High School. Why don't you come and join us? Well, the disc jockey did, and lo and behold, he was so moved by the thousand of people in a high school auditorium that was there to honor the 23 men and recognize the memorial that was being placed at McKeesport High School, he felt compelled to write this book, Did You Know That Boy? The title is very interesting because the title was derived from one of the fellows uh, was in Navy basic training up the Great Lakes. When my cousin Michael was killed in 1966, his mother cut out the obituary and the uh, story that was associated with that and sent it to them. And in the letter, she said, did you know that boy? Well, certainly he did. They played ball together. They lived two blocks away. He was, they were buddies with each other in high school. Certainly he knew that boy. So we thought that was most fitting because we all can say that, hey, did you know Tommy Sweeney? Hey, did you know Tibor Sotek, a Czechoslovakian immigrant whose family came to this country in 1964? And I remember him very well, uh, Robert, because he grew up in my neighborhood of McKeesport. And when we were young guys, we stood on the corner, figuring out what we were going to do that day. We we're going to play baseball. What are we going to do? Play Army, play Cowboys. What we we're going to do as young men. Mm -hmm. Tibor, trying to assimilate and trying to be like one of the boys here in America, he always brought his baseball glove and his six-gun uh, toy cap pistol on his hip. And he said, I don't know what you boys do today, but I'm ready. He was a big kid, well-loved. We, we all thought the world of him. He tried so hard to assimilate with us. Sadly, he got drafted, and he was killed in Vietnam. Oh, wow. Uh, the book, I understand, no longer in uh, print where you can go and buy a copy, but there is one available at the Carnegie Library. Is that true? 
That's correct, Robert. The book is out of print. We had it on Amazon for several times, and it, it took two printings, and it was sold out. Well, there are three copies in the Carnegie Library System that are available, and I always uh, tell people, even if your library system is in uh, Wexford, okay, your library system can order the book from the three libraries uh, that have the book, and they'll send it to you at your local library, and many people have done that. It's also available there are some limited copies available at the McKeesport Regional History Center in Renzi House and Park on Eden Park Boulevard. And I make note of that because we relocated the McKeesport 23 monument to that McKeesport Regional History Center. And it's outside right by the flagpole. It's more mm -hmm. prominent. When we had it in the high school courtyard, clearly with COVID and the way the, way the world is today, the high school was limiting Attend, limiting access to that, and we felt, boy, nobody's seeing this. Maybe they're just seeing it on Memorial Day when we have a two-hour window of a program. So we made the decision to relocate that. We had quite a ceremony about three weeks ago, and we had 300 people there in the rain, okay, for about a 45-minute ceremony where I read the names, of course. We had some uh, family members that came from North Carolina and West Virginia to be part of this program again. And I tell people, if we had this program again next week, we'd have another 300 people there. That's the passion in which that community um, recognizes the McKees 23. Everybody got, well, most people have their service cap on. You've seen the guys with the blue caps on and mm -hmm. Vietnam veteran ribbon and such. Some guys had some uniform items on. Many families, older now, of course, still feel the pain of seeing their family member's name on that memorial. And it's quite a story. Uh, we, McKees Board veterans, raised the money ourselves. We didn't have any uh, raffle tickets or such. And we got the help of a local funeral home to construct the memorial and, in fact, relocate it as well. But the book is so well written. Mm. Dale Staller is the author. And the book just tells what it was like growing up in a hard scrabble uh, western Pennsylvania town. It shares the impact of the Vietnam War. It's a vivid and emotional testimony to all those who were serving in the military during that time in a war that was not popular as it right. went forward. And again, McKees were not having that counterculture uh, as other cities did. It was a different world for us. Many of us who came home up through the West Coast were told, don't wear your uniform. A cab driver won't pick you up. There are protesters out there that will accost you and call you names. Well, finally, when you get on your flight and you come home, you're back home in the caseboard in western Pennsylvania where it's a total different, was a total different welcoming and a total different atmosphere. So anyone interested in that book, again, they can go uh, to the McKeesport Regional History Center in Renzi House and Park and or contact your local library. They'll be able to uh, obtain it for you. It's quite a read. Robert, I've had guys I served with. I was one of the guys from the East Coast and all my buddies were from the West Coast, uh, Seattle, Washington, Portland, San Francisco. You talk at the chow hall and when you're in your travels and things like that, you always talk about your hometown. Well, when I sent this book to my buddies, they said, Don, we can almost hear you talking about growing up in McKeesport, how you got a <laughs> quarter Iron City beer on Saturday night and thought you were up on a hillside being cool and uh, smoking cigarettes and did what guys did when they were young men, uh, still not mature enough yet. But uh, he said, Don, we can hear you talking like that. And the stories that were told of these young men, you know, you had young men uh, that were, uh, this one uh, young man, uh, Kenneth Klein, he was a clerk typist. That was his military op occupational specialty. He was a slightly built kid, wasn't a hard charger. He was no Rambo. He was serving his country, and he was serving his country as a clerk typist. Mm -hmm. Remembering for every combatant, there were seven or eight people that were supporting that combatant. Right. Well, they had a, it was Tet Offensive. The base that he was on became overrun. Every soldier is a rifleman. Told him, pick up your rifle and get going. So he had to defend uh, his area. Well, he ended up dying in a foxhole, and the story has it that he died with, during hand-to-hand -hand combat. He was awarded the Silver Star, and if I knew the kid personally, you would never thought him growing up he would be that type of valiant soldier, so so uh, brave. And it just goes to show you that uh, when you're in a given a situation, you'll rise to the occasion, and that young man, along with these others, did. So that book tells so many stories like that. It's a tearjerker. And I know many people have told me, Don, when we read this, we had tears in our eyes. We had to put it down because it tells the story of each, 20, each of the 23 men. And it tells it at length. For example, when Gregory Popowitz, Marine recon, was a 
he was a tough kid. Okay, mm-hmm. you can see him as a Marine recon, just a hard charging young man. Well, he was in Quezon. Quezon, January 1968, was a siege that was like no other siege during that war. When he came home, his casket had to be closed because there were no remains. His uh-huh. mother pleaded with the funeral home, please, I want to see my son. They were trying to tell her, ma'am, there's, there's nothing to see. She finally uh, encouraged them to such a point, so emotional, they opened the casket, and what was there was an empty Marine Corps dress blue uniform. Oh, my. Uh, just it gives so you chills to of, even hear the story. I can understand well, why it's so it, emotional for so many people uh, upon reading it. Once again, did you know that boy? One Town's Remembrance of the Vietnam War. And once again, it's available in the Carnegie Library system. There will be a link up to that so that you can go ahead and reserve the book for yourself. There's something else I wanted to get to as well, Donald. And once again, we're talking with Donald Nemchek. His own cousin was one of Nikisport 23. He, too, serving in Vietnam. You are a very outspoken advocate for veterans. And we spoke briefly earlier in mentioning the Veterans Breakfast Club. What can you tell us about this group? Veterans Breakfast Club has been around for 15 years, Robert. It started when Todd DePestino, the executive director, started talking to World War II veterans during a breakfast at local restaurants. Uh, they would be invited, and everybody. our tagline is, every veteran has a story. Well, it continued to grow and grow, and what happens? COVID happens, okay? There's no more face-to-face meetings. There's no more monthly breakfasts. The Veterans Breakfast Club opted to go virtual. was the best thing that ever happened to us. We have Zoom calls every Monday. Mm-hmm. We have a monthly newsletter that goes out. We have a quarterly magazine that could be sent to any veteran or interested party at no charge to them. And it's every veteran has a story. It ranges from World War II veterans who we have a 102-year-old <laughs> Navy wave who lives in Forest Hills who was one of the code breakers of the Enigma Code. She's on every Zoom call. She's sharp as a tack. She was on the PBS Memorial Day special last year sitting at the dais with other women, uh, World War II veterans. She's delightful. We have Vietnam veterans, and we have veterans from post-9-11. And every veteran has a story. We often get authors who have written books about uh, military conflicts and strategies, and some of it's just stories about uh, their time in Vietnam. Some of the most interesting uh the guests that we have were donut dollies and Navy nurses, I'm sorry, uh, military nurses who served in Vietnam. Some of their stories are compelling and, and tear jerkers, and some of them are actually funny. Some of the ones from the donut dollies were very, very interesting. The donut dollies were young ladies who uh, volunteered through the Red Cross. They had to be college graduates, and they, served, they went in Vietnam and visited soldiers for morale purposes. And what's very interesting and somewhat uh, harrowing is the fact that some of these women who were exposed to the herbicide Agent Orange cannot get veterans, veteran administration benefits because they are not veterans. They were volunteers through the Red Cross. So the insurance company says, you better not tell us that you were in a wartime theater because your insurance may not cover it. So here they're in between uh, you know, whatever they have to do uh, to get themselves treated and, and the economics of it. And also the Veterans Breakfast Club makes return trips to Vietnam. They're going back in November this year for the third time. And they bring veterans uh, and their families or any interested parties back to Vietnam. And they start up in Hanoi. They go to the POW prison camps. They go through the museums. It's known in Vietnam as America's War. It's not the Vietnam War. Hmm. It's known as America's War. They really tone it down in Vietnam. Vietnam is a very entrepreneurial country. They love Americans. When you encounter them, they want to speak English. Uh, they are just so enthusiastic, and it, most of them are under 30. So the, the, the pains of war are not really with them, although they know what it was. But it's not like here in America where we're staying with this for well over 50 years. But uh, the people in Vietnam and the people with the Veterans Breakfast Club arrange these trips, and they're just so well thought of because oftentimes it's closure for some veterans. It's cathartic, of course. They go to a place where maybe they had lost a, a buddy 
or maybe they were wounded themselves. There was a very interesting story on one of our recent podcasts where one of the veterans was standing at a particular location, and in the distance was a Vietnamese man, about the same age. They started looking at each other, looking at each other. The interpreter come over. Well, it so happened that they were actually um, enemies against each other. That North Vietnamese guy was one of the combatants in the same battle that this Marine was when they were both 19 years old. Here's 50 years later, now they're hugging each other. They say, we're not combatants anymore. We're human beings. That's and right. it's just those types of stories are, are just amazing. I, I never get tired of it. Donald Nemchek with us. One of the things I want to do on this podcast, Donald, is give people the ability and the power to do something to make a difference and, and not just sit back and accept what's happening around them. And as a veteran, as one who's been involved with the McKeesport 23 for all of these years, actively involved in advocacy, what do you see is the best way for those of us who are civilians that have never served to most honor those and their families, those that gave their lives and their families that survived them? One of the easiest ways and most appropriate ways, Robert, is to listen. Listen to their stories and ask them, what happened during your time in the service? Oftentimes, we don't want to, um, we did not want to uh, express ourselves most of the time because you didn't want to tell your family the fear, to put fear into them of what you're going through. Many of the letters going back and forth uh, go back and say, oh, the weather's hot here, the child is lousy, I can't wait to come home, how skippy the dog and... Are you putting gasoline in my 1956 Chevy? Mm -hmm. And the family were right back, oh, everything's fine. So everything was sanitized, not by the government, but individually. People say, I don't want my, my girlfriend to know what we're doing here. Okay, I don't want my family to be afraid that I'm in harm's way every day. Well, I don't want to let them know that I've been in the hospital for three weeks because I have malaria. Okay, they'll worry too much. So one of the best things I think people can do is to listen. If you see a, a fellow who appears to be of age of the Vietnam War and he has his military cap on, recognizing that he was a Vietnam veteran or his particular unit or the branch of service, yes, it's great to say, hey, thank you for your service and offer to shake his hand. But sometimes you just want to listen and say, you know, we honor what you did and you didn't get a fair shake when you were coming home. If you want to talk to me about it, I'd be very interested in your story. Many veterans come back, Robert, and think no one really cares. They went back to the VFW or the American Legion, and they were scorned and says, you, were, you guys lost the first war that America ever lost. They were, so the guys said, hey, wow. heck with this, I'm not going to participate. So they kept a lot inside. Keeping it inside leads to a lot of problems with PTSD. You have to express mm -hmm. yourself. Sometimes writing would help. And we often tell uh, veterans that, hey, write your story. You don't have to be Shakespeare. But you can just write your story. It doesn't have to be grammatically correct. Just write it down. Mm -hmm. The Veterans Breakfast Club offers a free service to record veterans' oral histories for their families, and they'll put it on a DVD or whatever, a disc for them, and they can share that. And if they want to share it with the public, we will put it on our website. And may I give the website for the Veterans Breakfast Club? Well, veteransbreakfastclub.org. That is veteransbreakfastclub.org. You can go on to our Zoom calls every Monday, see the archives, look at and hear the oral histories from veterans. You can see the newsletter and we give topics. For example, one of the little factoids that we just put out, Pearl Harbor. Most people know that oil is still dripping from the USS Arizona after all these years. The environmentalists said we have to do something to clean this up. It's sacred ground, though. There's 1,300 men buried there. Okay, in, at sea with their ship. Well, what happens is oysters, now you have to remember, why do they call it Pearl Harbor? What do oysters make? Pearls. Mm -hmm. Oysters naturally filter water, 45 gallons for each oyster. So they're now harvesting oysters and putting them into Pearl Harbor to clean that area up from all that oil that has dripped after all those years. Wow. That's a little factoid that we wow. pick up. Some of that stuff is interesting, but what's more compelling, Robert, is the fact that every veteran has a story and we encourage them to tell us their story. What did you feel like when you come home? What was it like when you were away from home? How did, you know, how did you enjoy Christmas? Did you have a Christmas at that time? You know, those types of things. And just hearing the stories, and guys open up now more and more because the older we get, those stories are still in our mind. And sometimes we want to share them, and we want to share them before it's too late. Donald Nebchuk, once again with us, a U.S. Navy veteran, petty officer, and now retired, not only from the service, but from his civilian career and a very 
vocal and very passionate advocate for veterans. And once again, you can find out more going to veteransbreakfastclub.org. Donald, thank you very much for your time, and may you have a very blessed Memorial Day. To you as well, and to you as your listeners, Robert, thank you for this opportunity today. God bless America. Thank you very much for listening to the Mangino Talks podcast. New episodes drop Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern. For more on me and the show, be sure to visit ManginoTalks.com. Follow me on your favorite social media platform by using at Mangino Talks, or you can just Google Mangino Talks. Once you find me, please like, follow, subscribe, and share the pages with your friends and family. And thanks again for listening to the Mangino Talks podcast.